This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Suppose. I'm here for three proposal support at the Research Foundation. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I want to thank the organizers, uh, grants officers at the um, Baruch College for um, organizing this webinar. Uh, we had actually organized it before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, and it was going to be in person. Thank God for um, some of this um, technology that allows us to, um, to do this remotely. So thanks, thanks for joining us. I'll take the next slide, Dan. So what I, I wanted to do with today's presentation is um, go over a few um, few items. Uh, I wanted to share with you some of the services that uh, our office at the Research Foundation, the Award Pre Proposal Support Office, offers. Uh, I wanted to give give you some examples of workshops that we've um, we've done on targeted themes. Um, uh, some su successful efforts we've um, conducted in helping CUNY faculty awards, um, CUNY faculty win awards. Um, give you a little bit of an overview of the federal science funding landscape, uh, some data, some um, information about um, federal funding for uh, research uh, across the country. Uh, and then we're going to focus on agencies, specific agencies, and, and the kinds of uh, activities that um, some of these agencies um, uh, provide uh, for funding uh, faculty. Uh, with respect to NSF uh, and NIH, the De U.S. Department of Education, uh, and then we'll focus a little bit on COVID-19 federal research opportunities, uh, and we'll we'll end with um, um, some guidance, some tips, some advice in terms of how to prepare competitive research proposals. I'll take the next slide there. Okay. So our office, the APPS office, opened in, up in December 2015. Uh, our mandate was to help faculty develop a culture of research at CUNY and expand the capacity of grant seekers. Um, during the last um, four years, uh, we've interacted with quite a few faculty. We want to share with you some of those interactions. Uh, we're, our objective is to help faculty develop competitive proposals for submissions. Um, and we also want to be involved with um, CUNY management in trying to develop some strategies for grant opportunities, uh, bring CUNY faculty and staff uh, around some good best practices and multidisciplinary initiatives. Uh, how do we do this? We do it with individual consultations. So if any of you are interested in talking to us about uh, your research, um, we'll talk to you about your research, even if it's at the very basic stage, um, or if it's an, at an advanced stage and you're trying to get some guidance. Um, we do it through general uh, seminars uh, on grant design and tactics. Uh, this is one of those seminars. Uh, we organize targeted forums on specific themes. We will peer review your, your grant proposal. So before you even submit it to a uh, federal agency, what we'll do is we'll uh, find reviewers to um, uh, send it to for comment. Uh, the reviewers we find uh, are experts in your area of research. Uh, we'll first try to identify reviewers at uh, CUNY. Uh, and then if we can't find any reviewers at CUNY, CUNY we'll just search uh, across the country and across the world to find experts who are doing your type of research. Uh, we also do um, provide support for some of our funding uh, databases, um, Pivot um, and Grant Forward. And you can access those databases from our website, uh, our RF CUNY website. Um, all you need is a cuny.edu address. Uh, and all CUNY, all individuals with CUNY.edu email addresses have access 
to those uh, resources. And finally, we have a small program, a faculty travel for grant development program. We'll give you a very small amount of funding, $750, uh, to travel to um, sponsors who you want to meet and talk to about your research. I'll take the next uh, slide then. So these are examples of some targeted workshops uh, on, on strategic themes that we've uh, conducted over the last four years. We've done one on NSF career workshops, which are um, focused on career grants. Uh, and these are grants for early career faculty uh, to jumpstart their research. Um, we've had um, workshops on international grants specifically the Partnerships for International Research and Education uh, program at NSF. Uh, we've had Arts and Humanities philanthropy forums. Um, we've had um, broader impacts in grant writing. Now, NSF has two review criteria for your proposals. One is uh, intellectual merit. The second one is broader impacts. There's a lot of confusion regarding what NSF means by broader impacts, so we've had um, workshops to help you uh, identify that. We've had defense and intelligence. Uh, we've had SCORE grant workshops. Um, we've had health forums. So what we've done is we've identified certain strategic themes and prevented workshops. Keep track of our website. We'll announce these things, these um, targeted workshops. You can join us whenever, um, if and when you are available. And you can also recommend workshops for us. If there's a specific area that you want, um, you want us to do, please send us an email. Uh, tell us, you know, can you do, can you do a workshop on this program, or can you do a workshop on uh, urban planning, or can you do a workshop on on specifically this NIH program? We're we're open to um, um, your suggestions from you as well. I'll take the next uh, slide then. So. We've helped quite a few faculty over the four years. Um, these are examples of some of the successes we've had. Um, we've had uh, faculty at Hostos um, get an S STEM grant from NSF. This is a $1 million grant providing scholarships to underserved uh, um, minorities. Um, we've had um, IU at IUSU Improving Undergraduate STEM Education, uh, a partnership between Bronx Community College and Lehman College, uh, a $5 million um, grant. Um, Lehman College has also been the lead institution in the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, a $4.5 million grant to um, Lehman College, which is a partnership with a, a lot of CUNY, other CUNY institutions. Um, and the last one um, uh, on that list is one Gutman. This is this is the first NSF grant that Gut Gutman has received. Uh, its focus is more on testing the impact of culturally responsive pedagogy and streamlining uh, streamlined transfer, um, uh, streamlined support uh, in STEM for underrepresented students. And um, so these are just examples of some of the um, success stories with faculty that we've um, we've been um, very fortunate to uh, uh, help them in uh, as they develop their proposals. I'll take the next slide. I wanted to give you a um, a broad perspective on higher education research and development in, in the U.S. Uh, this is a chart from National Science Foundation's. Um, Higher Education Research and Development Survey that they do every year. Um, it gives you a, uh, it provides you with a, uh, an idea in terms of how much funding, uh, research and development funding is going out, um, going to uh, higher education institutions. As you can see, there about, there's about $75 billion going out. That's probably going to be increasing uh, as we speak because there's a lot of funding, COVID-19, research funding that, is, that um, federal agencies are receiving. Um, but important point to be made here is that uh, federally funded research is at almost 40 billion. Uh, Non-federally funded uh, 
research is at um, about 35 billion. So a huge amount of the R&D that's conducted at higher education institutions is um, funded by the federal government, uh, which is basically the focus of our presentation here today. I'll take the next slide then. So who funds, who are the major agencies funding uh, R&D at higher education institutions in the US? Well, first and foremost is NIH. Uh, and in terms of CUNY's portfolio, uh, our federal funding, NIH is for, first and foremost. Um, second is NSF. Um, NSF provides about $5 billion to higher education institutions in the US. Department of Energy is third, about 3.5 billion. Department of Defense is fourth, 3.3 billion. And NASA is fifth in terms of $2.9 billion. Um, so that gives you a nice, nice perspective in terms of where most of the funding from federal, the federal support is coming from, which agencies it's coming from. I'll take the next slide, to, Dan. So let's go into some detailed discussion about NSF. Um, NSF supports research um, in many different ways. Uh, it has a variety of different programs. Um, first and foremost, and the majority of NSF funding is going to their directorate program solicitations. What do I mean by directorate program solicitations? NSF is organized like a university. Um, there's an anthropology program. There's a biology program. Actually, there are a variety of biology programs. There is a um, political, there's a sociology program. Um, those programs receive allocations every year. Most of those programs get the brunt, receive the brunt of NSF funding. But in addition to those programs, there are what we call cross directorate programs, programs that go across disciplines. Um, the career program is one of them. Uh, these are programs focused on early career faculty. International programs is another one. The PIRE program is focused on international activities uh, across all disciplines. The career program is focused on early career faculty across all disciplines. Science and technology centers are focused on uh, providing support across all disciplines, except engineering. Engineering research centers are focused on providing support across all engineering disciplines. These are normally these cross directorate programs are large in terms of funding. Career career programs receive up to career awardees receive up to a half a million dollars. Prior awardees five million dollars. The STCs can receive uh, even you know um, five to ten million dollars. And the ERCs uh, on average uh, five to ten million dollars. So th these cr uh, cross directorate programs are usually very very large. If you're interested in submitting a proposal and you do not feel comfortable with submitting a proposal because you don't you do not feel any of these programs really directly match your research, a good way of um, uh, of handling that is contacting program officer, officers that you feel are very close to what your research is connected to. So. For example, if your research is between anthropology and sociology uh, and political science, and it's an amalgam of those three disciplines, but you feel there is no one program, it's probably not a bad idea to contact an NSF program officer and suggest to them that you would like to submit an unsolicited proposal. NSF usually is more than happy to receive those proposals. They'll review the proposal and provide you with an answer as to whether you'll receive funding or not. Another way is to look at NSF's eager uh, and rapid uh, proposals. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, eagers and rapid. Eager is really small concept grants for exploratory research. These are research areas that um, um, you have some exploratory uh, data, but you're really not, um, and you have some ideas, 
in terms of hypotheses, in terms of what you feel your research um, uh, can prove, but you really feel you need some uh, planning support uh, for some preliminary data. Eagers are designed to do that. Um, they're less, usually $300,000 for two years. Now, RAPIDS are Rapid Research Program at NSF is designed for severe urgency. We're undergoing a severe urgency right now. COVID-19 funding is a severe urgency um, research area. NSF has set aside one, close to $100 million for rapid proposals. So if any of you have any idea, ideas on trying to address um, COVID-19 uh, issues, uh, those proposals, and I'll show you a little later in this presentation on how to go about um, preparing uh, proposals for RAPID, usually $200,000 for one year. And then there's a fifth way, which is supplements. These are, if you have an existing NSF grant and you want to add a supplement uh, to your NSF grant, the this mechanism is the way to do it. Uh, to do it, um, REUs, you could do, uh, for example, if you have a proposal and you what you would like to do is you'd like to add an international partner, a supplement is a good way to do it. If you want to add students, supplement is also a good way to do it. Um, these are proposals that would benefit for some, for, from some add-on, uh, some additional uh, support uh, to address the goals of your project. Supplements are um, a good way to do it. And they're easy for NSF program officers to process. Um, they usually do not re require any outside review. Um, up to 20% of the proposal can be easily um, um, added to your, to your research. 20% of the total award amount added to your research to complete and add the correct component to your project. So always important to remember that NSF supports hypothesis-driven research. If you're just doing data collection, if you're just doing uh, research that you're not trying to answer any major research questions, uh, NSF is probably not the right. Uh, if it's more of an Im implementation uh, grant where you're implementing uh, programs or projects, uh, NSF is usually not the right place. NSF is a research-driven uh, um, funding agency. I'll take the next uh, slide. So let's talk about NSF's organizational structure. We talked about it a little bit before. Biological science, these are the major areas that NSF funds. Biological sciences, computer information sciences, education and human resources, engineering, geosciences, mathematical and physical sciences, social, behavioral, and economic sciences. Those are the areas NSF supports, okay? Um, within each of the directorates, of course, there are divisions. So there are sub, there are disciplines, sub-disciplines within each of these directorates. Uh, NSF hires uh, program directors. Uh, some of them are permanent program directors that have been there a long time. But NSF also has IPAs, rotators. Um, if you want to serve a short stint or short period of time at NSF, uh, I suggest you um, contact program officer uh, and look at their website. Vacancy announcements co go up for IPAs, they call them Inter Intergovernmental Personnel Act uh, researchers. Um, and um, look at those vacancy announcements. I strongly recommend um, you to do this because it gives you a very, very good idea in terms of how the whole process works. You'll have a very um, excellent perspective uh, on um, research, how NSF organizes its activities, how it funds the research, uh, and this is something you can carry with you back to your institution. Uh, and the, the advantages that you receive from, from that um, participation are, are great. Uh, I know individuals who have done it, uh, and the benefits are, are large. I'll take the next slide. 
So these are NSF review criteria. Um, two, intellectual. One is intellectual merit. The other one is broader impacts. Uh, there are, in addition to these two review criteria, there are, there's a, uh, a there are additional re review criteria based on each of the solicitations. Um, but the intellectual merit and broader impacts are the national sort uh, national board uh, authorized review criteria. Um, intellectual merit focuses more on what's the intellectual payoff of your research, how are you advancing the knowledge in your research act in your research area. Review panels measure you on that. The broader impacts is more focused on what impact does your research have on your institution, uh, on the individuals who are participating in it, and more importantly, what impact does it have on society? NSF wants to know that, and it really is part of the review criteria. I'll take the next uh, slide. So I've been asked to talk about uh, specific programs. There's no way that I can go through every individual program in these agencies. Uh, I'm focusing more on the programs that um, uh, your grants officers uh, recommended that we focus on uh, based on the experience of a lot of the faculty. So one area was the psychology program. Um, and some of the NSF supports research on psychology, not necessarily clinical psychology. Uh, its focus is more on social psychology. And what do we, we mean by social psychology? It's primarily the broad rubric of understanding uh, human social behavior. So these are some of the areas that we're uh, that NSF is funding, social cognition and attitudes, um, social and cultural influences, motivation, what pe makes people motiv motivated, how, pe how do people make decisions, uh, group dynamics and close relationships, uh, aggression, and how, how does aggression, um, what are the origins of aggression within individuals, uh, in a, and uh, social and uh, effective neuroscience, social psychophysiology, emotions, pro-social behavior, health-related behavior. Um, it could be chemical-induced behavior. Um, so personality and individual differences. So again, these, this is not looking at it from the clinical perspective. It's looking at it more from the social perspective. Um, if you're looking, if you're doing research on um, alcoholism and you're trying to identify uh, ways of helping of alcoholics overcome their alcoholism, NSF psychology program is not the right place for that funding. But if you're looking at broad um, understanding of alcoholism in the U.S., how uh, alcoholism affects um, in general, human beings uh, in the U.S., how it affects um, workplaces, um, it, um, how it affects um, uh, social settings. The psychology program probably is a good fit for that kind of research. I'll take the next slide. NSF Geosciences. Um, there are, I should say, there are about 50 individual programs within the Geosciences Directorate. Uh, so as you can see, uh, there are a large number of uh, funding categories within Geosciences, um, ranging from global climate change to um, uh, funding for um, uh, research on um, looking at um, uh, rise in ocean levels, but there are four four major <clears throat> major divisions within geosciences. Everything very much falls within these four divisions. Uh, the atmospheric and geospace sciences uh, supports research that add understanding of the behavior of the Earth's 
Earth's atmosphere and its interactions with the sun. There's the Earth sciences, which is more focused on processes uh, uh, in the evolution of the Earth itself. Ocean sciences, all aspects of global oceans and their interactions with the Earth and the atmosphere. And then polar programs, with, which supports Arctic and Antarctic uh, grants to researchers. Um, and providing polar facilities uh, to the researchers to do their research as well, and operational support of those facilities um, in the polar regions. There's no way I can go through every geosciences program. I su my suggestion is for you to look through the NSF website. If you have any um, um, ideas in terms of your research and the direction you want it to, to go, if you have any questions for us, feel free to contact us. Uh, but it is a huge directorate that gets more than $1 billion in funding every year. Um, the geosciences is also um, is the home of the Belmont Forum, which is an international collaborative forum um, that involves many international research councils uh, for collaborative activities, international collaborative activities in the geosciences. I'll take um, the next slide. Uh, again, biological sciences, um, geosciences, biological sciences are two of the largest directorates, um, also very well funded. Um, this directorate has five major thrust divisions, five major areas in terms of how they break out their research activities. The first one is biological infrastructure, supports the development of large scale infrastructure and centers uh, to help advance biological research. Um, these grants are usually very large. Um, the next one is the division of environmental biology, mostly focused on evolutionary and ecological research on species, populations, communities, ecosystems. Um, across all spatial and temporal scales. Uh, there's IOS, which is the Integrative Organismal Systems, research aimed at organisms as units of biological organization, uh, encouraging the use of interdisciplinary approaches to solving comp complex problems in organismal biology. So for example, if, you wanna, if your research is focuses on apes, um, this is the right place for it. It's, it's focused, if your research is focused on fish, this is probably the right place for it. There's the Division of Molecular and Cellular Bi Biological Sciences. Um, this area is more focused on um, the molecular level. Um, basically, it supports quantitative and interdisciplinary approaches uh, at the molecular. So if your focus is more on genes, um, uh, on the cells, um, this, then this is this is your area of, of uh, support. And finally, there's emerging frontiers, which is kind of the catch-all category, but it's more focused on multidisciplinary research opportunities uh, that arise from advances in, in disciplinary research. So um, that's, uh, in a nutshell, that kind of covers biological science. Again, many, a variety of different programs in the biological sciences. Um, Feel free to contact us if you have uh, ideas in terms of what your research um, is and which part of the biological sciences you should be looking at for funding. We'll take the next slide. Okay, NSF Education and Human Resources. So NSF supports a lot of activities in research disciplines, like the ones we just talked about, biology, geosciences, earth sciences, um, psychology, social psychology. But NSF is also very much focused on trying to develop the education and human resources in educational institutions. Um, so it does have a program uh, or a directorate focused on supporting graduate education, uh, designed to support graduate students and the development of novel, innovative programs to, to prepare 
graduate students. Um, there's the Division of Human Resources Development. Uh, it's this program. This uh, director is, has specifically has programs on undeserved communities. Uh, the LSM program we talked about. This is the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minorities program we, we talked about. It's housed in this program. The advanced program, which is focused on building um, the capacity of um, um, for growth of women in academia, uh, is also in this um, uh, in this directorate. Uh, so um, it's it's the the program has uh, a lot of um, activity, many activities focused on assisting uh, HBCUs uh, and minority serving institutions as well. There's the Division of Undergraduate Education, um, where uh, there are two and four year institutions interested in improving curricula. Hold on one second. I think I lost my. Um, um, so it's two and four year institutions improving curricula, instruction, labs, infrastructure, diversity of students and faculty. Um, and then there's the research on learning in formal and informal settings. Um, this is more, this directorate is focused more on learning and teaching across all dis disciplines in formal, informal set settings. What do we mean by informal settings? Uh, museums, for example, for example. Um, a lot of uh, funding for museums comes out of this. Uh, so NSF is interested also in providing support for these activities, citizen uh, uh, science activities are focused on this um, um, this division. <clears throat> so the, these are these are the education and human resources directorates that uh, directorate activities, um, and um, again there are about twenty or thirty programs in this directorate, uh, and that. Um, we can help guide you in terms of what, where your research uh, uh, overlaps, which which programs are the most likeliest programs to match uh, or to fund your your research activities. I'll take the next slide. Okay, let's let's move on to NIH. NIH is um, again the largest individual investigator funding agency in the US and maybe the world. Um, the last I uh, looked at its budget, it's up to $40 billion a year. Uh, most of it going to extramural funding activities, which means academia. Uh, there is a large intramural uh, uh, funding uh, for uh, NIH as well. These are research activities that are conducted <clears throat> on site at NIH, um, focused on um, disease diseases. Um, but anyway, to, to give you the, the broad spectrum of what NIH does, um, it has over 50, over 15 uh, various institutes, each focused on a specific type of disease. Um, the one, of course, that has received the most uh, activity lately is the one right in the middle there, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, <clears throat> which Congress provided an additional $2 billion in funding recently um, to deal with this COVID-19 crisis. Um, so, um, so I should note that uh, NIH has also received 
um, uh, the other institutes have also received increases in funding. Not as much as uh, the Allergy and Infectious Diseases uh, uh, Institute, but still significant funding has gone uh, has, um, gone to um, some of the other um, institutes as well. I'll take the next slide. So here, what does NSF look, uh, NIH look, like, look at when you submit a proposal? These are the review criteria that NIH uh, looked at. You remember, NSF was more focused on intellectual merit and broader impacts. Um, uh, as a, those broad review criteria, NIH breaks it up into five separate categories. Um, the first one is significance. Does the project address an important problem or a critical barrier? To progress in the field. Uh, the next one is investigators. Are the, are the uh, guys or uh, uh, researchers well suited to the project? Third is innovation. Um, does the proposal deal with um, current research or clinical practice uh, uh, shifts in paradigms, uh, new approaches, new methodologies, instrumentation, interventions? Uh, how about the approach, the methods? Uh, and finally, the environment is the institution. Is there institutional support? Um, is there equipment, other resources to enable the researcher who's um, submitting this proposal to conduct the research? So, uh, NIH is a little bit more detailed, uh, but the broad NSF criteria pretty much encapsulate a lot of what NIH has in its review criteria here. Uh, and they use the same kind of, uh, if you dig, dig down, dig deep into NSF's uh, research criteria, uh, funding criteria, they're very, very similar to what NIH's uh, uh, review criteria are. I'll take the next slide. So um, I I'd like to, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the NIH R15 Research Enhancement Awards. These um, uh, awards are small-scale research projects at undergraduate institutions health professional schools and graduate schools, which means they're open to um, virtually all CUNY institutions. Um, and um, they're about $6 million. Uh, so all non-health professionals components of the institute together have not received support from NIH to totaling more than $6 million per year. Uh, I think virtually all um, in four of the last uh, seven years. Virtually all CUNY institutions, I believe, other than um, um, Hunter College and probably School of Public Health probably fit that criteria. Uh, the, PI, the PI may not be an active NIH, may not have an active NIH grant at the time of an R15 award. Um, so, but if you, if you have one, um, you'll have to choose between the one you have and this R15 award. Uh, you may, you may be a, one, uh, a key personnel for an active NIH grant held by another PI. Um, however, the PI may not be awarded more than one R15 grant at a time. It's, this award is limited to three years. Direct costs are limited to $300,000 over the entire project. Uh, R15 grants are multi-year funded awards. The entire budget for all years of the award must be requested in the first budget year. And standard, Submission dates are, uh, deadline dates are February 25th, June 25th, October 25th. So you really have three chances during the year um, to submit the proposal. So in essence, proposals are submitted year round uh, as long as you submit it before each of those, of those dates. So it's very well, um, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a program that, is um, receiving awards on a on a regular basis. I'll take the next slide. R01 research uh, project uh, grant program. This is probably the largest uh, research grant uh, program that uh, NIH has. Award is made to support specific projects uh, in areas representing the investigator's specific interests and competencies. So it's very broad. It includes a lot of different areas, uh, a lot of different diseases, a lot of different specialties. Uh, R01 awards are, are, are 
uh, application budgets are not limited, but need to reflect the actual needs of the proposed project. Uh, you can request an award from one to five years, um, each normally 12 months in duration. Um, applications can be renewed by competing for an additional project period. Again, these grant applications submitted February 5th, new grant applications on the 5th, June 5th, February 5th, October 5th. Um, renewal, resubmission, or revised grant applications are March 5th, July 5th, and November 5th. Um, very broad uh, and um, uh, one of the largest um, NIH um, uh, programs. I'll take the next slide. NIH score grants. <clears throat> score grants are focused on capacity building, seeks to increase the research competitiveness of faculty at under-resourced institutions with limited NIH R01 funding that have ex explicitly stated historical missions or historical track records focused on training and graduate students from underrepresented groups in biomedical research. This includes most CUNY institutions. Um, they have, there are three different flavors in the SCORE program. One is for investigators who have a track record of research activity, seeking to continue that research activity and build on it. That's the SC1. SC2s, these are pilot project awards, people who are at the beginning stages uh, and who are applying for their first independent award, interested in testing a new idea. So these are basically startup awards. And then finally, there's the SC3, investigators who have been engaged in scholarly research and published and who want to continue to conduct competitive research of limited scope to increase the publication and eventually transition to non-score support. Um, most NIH, most um, institutions at uh, CUNY are eligible. I do not believe the um, community colleges are, uh, but four-year institutions are eligible. Um, there is a limit um, in terms of eligibility. If you reach a certain dollar amount, uh, and I believe Hunter is the only, Hunter College is the only one that has uh, exceeded that dollar amount. Uh, used to be eligible, but this year for the first time is not eligible for NIH score grants. I'll take the next slide. I wanted to talk now a little bit about the Department of Education. Um, so Department of Education has three types of grants. One are block grants, states. The second are um, individual grants to either institutions, um, I'm sorry, the individual grants. Individual grants are mostly grants to students. These are Pell grants. Um, to my knowledge, there are no other individual grants. The third kind is individual uh, grants to institutions, like institutions of higher education. Um, what I've done here is I've identified some of the institutes or the offices within the Department of Education that have active research announcements. Um, there's the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, there's the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, and there's the Institute of Education Sciences. Um, and these are the various categories um, that they're focused on. Um, there are grants focused on parent information and training. There's training on parents of children with disabilities. These are, these are grants to institutions who are focused on training and information for parents of children with disability. These are institutions helping parents of children with disabilities. There's interdisciplinary preparation for special education, early intervention, and related services for serving children with disabilities who have high intensity needs. There's rehabilitation long-term training program. There's the vocational rehabilitation counseling program. Um, there's supporting effective educa educator development program. There's education and innovation research. 
comprehensive literacy state development program. There's teacher and school, school leader incentive program, ready to learn programming, managing school assistance, magnet school assistance program. And then there's the migrant education program. Institute for Education Sciences also has uh, two activities supporting mostly statisticians, statistical and research methodology in education, using <clears throat> longitudinal data to support state education policy making, grant making programs. Um, these are the only active grants. To my knowledge, other than Pell Grants, I do not know of any other um, programs that are focused on specifically on individuals, uh, mostly focused on institutions. Um, I'll take the next slide. Okay, what I'd like to do is in terms of COVID-19 research grant opportunities, I'd like to take you to our webpage, which is the <clears throat> Research Foundation uh, webpage. Um, this is what, um, if you go to our webpage and go to the Explore Pre-Award Resources, Uh, we've, what we've done is we've listed uh, a set of uh, COVID-19 emergency relief opportunities for faculty. Uh, we've broken up into three categories, which is um, uh, guidance to uh, biomedical health science and social science PIs on COVID-19, guidance to art, arts and culture PIs on COVID-19, and finally, um, we have um, flexibilities to NSF principal investigators uh, issued by the National Science Foundation. Um, I have to say that the, the two agencies that have done the most in terms of identifying COVID-19 opportunities, are, again, are N NSF and NIH. Um, what um, my suggestion uh, is for um, Let's dig deeper into into the guidance to the CUNY Biomedical Health Science and Social Science PIs. <clears throat> Can you click on the um, on that guidance to um, CUNY Biomedical Health? Okay. Federal agencies um, are um, providing support. Uh, the NSF has several mechanisms. Uh, I talked about um, uh, rapid mechanism that NSF has um, and um, uh, so the rapid research mechanism is described here um, that's probably the fastest way you're going to get funding on the COVID-9 from NSF um, <laughs> um, can you take it down a little bit more? The next um, page. Okay. Um, NSF has issued a Dear 19, uh, a Dear Colleague letter. Dear Colleague letter is another way, that, another mechanism that NSF uses um, to direct faculty to research activities. Uh, and when NSF does this, it's primarily focused on trying to get you to submit uh, proposals to specific, specific programs that I identified previously in the, in the um, um, uh, in this presentation. Um, but NSF also, uh, the COVID-19, the SBIR program has also um, uh, uh, issued a dear colleague letter as, as well. Um, the National Institutes of Health also have issued these um, administrative supplements, uh, NIH urgent awards. So these are, again, similar mechanisms to what NSF has um, for COVID-19 research. At the bottom of this page, we've listed some private, asso some um, philanthropic associations uh, that have specifically mentioned COVID-19, American Heart Association, 
and there also there are other private funders. So my recommendation is, uh, if you're looking for some private funding, please go to this uh, page. Um, and then, more importantly, access Pivot and Grant Forward. Type in COVID-19. My understanding is Pivot and Grant Forward are listing individual COVID-19 activities by name. So you can access, and there have been a lot of smaller organizations that have issue, issued, philanthropic organizations issued COVID-19 recently, very recently, within the last two weeks. Okay, I'll take the uh, next slide. Okay, uh, let me end this by just providing you with some tips for writing competitive proposals. Um, this is advice that we give to all faculty that we interact with. Um, first and foremost, your sponsors want to know um, the size and scope of the intellectual payoff. They want to know what you're adding to knowledge. What, what kind of payoff, intellectual payoff is there? Um, what is your proposal? How transformative is your proposal? Uh, are you at the forefront of science? Uh, that's what they want to know. And they're going to judge your proposal based on how forward-looking, forward-thinking it is. Is it addressing new challenges? Is it addressing new things? Um, during this period of COVID-19 crisis, are you coming up with a good way of um, uh, identifying uh, basic research that can develop a, a vaccine? You know, they, they're looking for a huge intellectual payoff. So always keep that in mind when you're writing a proposal. Proposals should also use plain, simple English. Avoid technical language as much as possible. We know that's not possible for a lot of fields, but Bear in mind that reviewers aren't necessarily going to be the ones, uh, uh, the reviewers aren't going to be knowledgeable necessarily in all of the terms in your specific research. They will be knowledge, knowledgeable in some, but they won't be knowledgeable in all of them. For example, you might have a sociology um, uh, professor uh, reviewing an anthropology um, uh, proposal. Um, you might have a chemist looking over a physics proposal. Um, so keep in mind that your, your proposal should be written in such a way where, where an anthropologist can understand uh, a sociology um, uh, and vice versa. Um, so so if, you're, if you're preparing a social science proposal, write it for a social science um, panel. Uh, keeping in mind that you might have people uh, across disciplines sitting on that panel. Uh, keep in mind that this is not a journal article. You're not presenting research results. You're proposing. You're you're conducting research. Uh, you have a research plan. You have specific activities that you have in that research plan. Uh, you have you have your methods are are, are identified. Uh, if you're sampling, your sample is identified. Um, how are you? Are you doing, are you gathering, are you conducting surveys? Um, do you, have you provided enough information in terms of what the content of those surveys are? Um, do you have a method for uh, distributing, disseminating uh, research after you've completed it? So <clears throat> it's very different. Preparing a proposal is very different than, than preparing a, um, uh, a research um, uh, article. Identify what you want to study again. Research questions, theories, hypotheses, methods, um, your team, your budget, your project evaluation as well. Evaluation has become of paramount interest recently. Not enough to propose research. You have to put also propose a method of whether um, evaluating your research activity. Uh, do not include more information than requested in the announcement. That's usually uh, um, not a good thing to do. If you don't have enough space, try to use tables, figures, and flowcharts. Uh, adhere to all formatting rules. Your, um, your office, your grants office will help you with that. 
age limitations, font sizes, virus sketches, key personnel. Make it visually appealing and easy, easy on reviewers. Uh, include enough information in the budget justification. Uh, current and pending support is required. Um, institutional facilities and equipment to be used. You should provide adequate detail there. A data management plan, postdoctoral mentoring plan is required in NSF. I'm not sure it's required in NIH proposals. Um, IRB, if you would need IRB, so uh, letters of commitment if needed. Um, get your proposals peer reviewed um, before submission. Send it to us. Give it to a colleague. Get comments from as many people as you can. More heads are better than one. If heavily data oriented, you can also use CUNY's Graduate Center, Quanti uh, Quantitative Research Consulting Center. They can help you with data as well. So, anyway, that ends our. Uh, my presentation, um, and uh, feel free to contact us. This is our um, contact information. Um, there are three of us in the uh, in the apps program: myself, my colleague Ingrid, Valentin, uh, and my colleague Dan. Um, contact any one of us. Uh, we're well versed in all of the apps activities. We're here to help you. Uh, we want to grow the research here at CUNY. Uh, we think we have over the last four years, uh, and um, anything we could do to help you um, is um, we're available. Uh, hi everyone, this is uh, John's colleague Dan. Um, I get, we're now uh, opening the floor to some Q and A, so I've unmuted everyone. Um, but I see that a few of you still have your microphones off. So if you want to ask a question, please go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and uh, fire away. Um, Dan, there actually may be comments written comments you see the top right yeah hi everyone um if you don't have any um well if you're not if you're not able to ask your question um via microphone you can always type it into the chat box and we can see it okay so we have a question here hello uh are the department of education grants k-12 based um some Department of Education grants are K through 12 based. Um, some Department of Education grants are higher education based. So it does really vary by the grant. So there is no one size fits all. Although the um, the Office of um, Elementary and Secondary Education, most of those grants are focused on K through 12. So I had a question. This is Sonali Hazarika. I'm at uh, Baruch College. Uh, so the question was related to the rapid, um, the or the part of the rapid for the COVID-19. So if uh, uh, one wants to apply for that, I think I went onto the website and it had, uh, you know, they had these projects under consideration. And uh, they kind of said uh, that they will, uh, that you, know, you could do like a pre-app kind of a thing to give them a sense of what you want to do in advance before you actually submit a big picture, like a bigger proposal, because then they can tell you whether you know it's already something they're already looking at doing. Does that make sense? That that is correct. That is correct. What they want to see is they want to see a two pager. Uh, they would like you to. Um, Organize your your research on two pages. Uh, submit it to them. Um, uh, but there are specific um, areas they, they would like to see you co cover. So what I could do is, you, why don't you uh, send me an email, uh, and I can I can send you exactly the areas they would like you to to um, uh, be focused on. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Jim. 
John, it's Melissa. Um, can you also send me that as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd be more Thanks. than happy to. Yeah. Hi, this is Tatiana Emanuel uh, in psychology from Baruch College as well. Um, Hi, how are you, Tatiana? I think we talked thank you before. For Yes, thank you for doing the presentation. Uh, I was wondering um, what you think uh, will happen now that things have changed so much. So do we expect to see a shift of funds from the regular uh, areas of interest to COVID-19 or will, would, would we expect things to be the way we know, the way, the way they were and in addition have the COVID-19 funding? Because I'm wondering if things are going to be changing a lot. I know it's a hard question, but I was wondering if you have any sense for that. Uh, I have to say that um, there probably has been some shifting of funding um, to support COVID-19, but I, I, I don't think it is at the expense of the regular NSF programs. I think the COVID-19 funding is over and above that uh, because um, NSF usually uses this as an opportunity to ask for more support from Congress uh, for COVID-19 related uh, funding. Um, if, if I were you, um, I would, I would um, um, and I had a COVID-19 related uh, idea that you would like to see funded, um, I would go ahead and submit it. Uh, you don't, I would go ahead and submit it anyway, because I think this is, um, um, because I think there's a lot of additional funding that has been provided to NSF. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? I see a question here from Diego Hildebrand. Do we need IRB approval for human subjects before submitting grants? So the way NSF does this is that um, they want you to have submitted your request for IRB approval. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they will hold Back your award if you're scheduled for if your if your proposal is reviewed and used well uh, and it is awarded uh, it will not it will not give you the money until uh, IRB approval is, is received so it's not going to affect your award uh, but it may uh, result in um, your award being um, um, awarded at a later time until your IRB approval is received. And we'll make these slides available. I, I see. I, I see. There's uh, um, there are questions. Lots of questions here about making the slides available. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Um, so, if you have any more questions, of course, you know we're we're here. Uh, we're available anytime. Okay, I think that uh, we'll end our our presentation. Uh, feel free to contact us, and we're here to uh, help you with your grant uh, development activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, John and Dan. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Bye now.